I said in the first service, and it's every bit as true now, even though I've done it one time, that when you choose some of your favorite hymns and your favorite psalm, and the choir sings the song that you requested that they sing, you are undone before you've even begun. <laughs> Thank you all so much. As we prepare to hear God's word to us this morning, let us pray together. Gracious God, you have promised to be with us when we gather in your name. So we know that you are here with us now. Because you are here, we ask that you help us to hear you. And in that hearing, may we learn to be obedient to the living word, even Jesus our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. I have two texts that I want to read and share with you today. One is a gospel text and one is an epistle from Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth. So first, Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 to 45, and I'll be reading both texts from the New Revised Standard Version of Scripture. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. The next lesson is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 5 through 7. And just to give you a little background, the church at Corinth, to whom Paul is writing this letter, drove Paul absolutely nuts. They were always fighting with one another. They were always at odds. They were always disagreeing with him. They were not living in ways that he wanted them to live. And nonetheless, Paul reaps, heaps, heaps on them great praise. He has high hopes for them. So hear this word of God through the Apostle Paul to us this day. We do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars, or clay pots, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, as you of course have figured out already, this is my last Sunday with you. My retirement officially begins on July 1. So today I want to share with you some personal reflections about life in general, I guess, and the things that I have come to value most highly in my life. And I'm hoping that uh, these things that I share with you will somehow also make a connection with you and with your life experience. If I were to ask you what things in your life are most important to you, what would you say? What things have shaped your life and have shaped your sense of yourself? What things have determined how you use your days? How you spend your time and, and your money and your energy? What do you treasure above all else? Is there a pearl of great value for which you would give up everything else, or maybe for which you have already given up everything else? Our texts for today deal with these kinds of questions. Both of the texts talk about treasure. Now, they say some different kinds of things about treasure, but treasure is definitely their theme. In the Gospel text, Jesus speaks of the kingdom of heaven as being like a treasure hidden in a field, which is so valuable that it is worth everything else that one possesses. 
It's like a merchant, he says, who has been searching for fine pearls, finding the most precious pearl of all and selling everything else in order to have that one pearl. Living under the rule of God, being a part of the kingdom of heaven, Jesus seems to be saying, is the most important thing in life. In the epistle text today from 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul talks about the treasure that is in us as followers of Jesus. That treasure in us, he says, is the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Or as the message translation puts it perhaps a bit more clearly, our lives filled up with light as we saw and understood God in the face of Christ, all bright and beautiful. That sounds pretty spectacular, but Paul wants us to know that we hold this treasure in us, not in some sort of gilded treasure chests, not in some holy of holies somewhere, but just in the unadorned clay pots of our ordinary lives, as the message translation puts it. There's nothing more special, there's nothing more holy about us than about anyone else. The focus isn't on us. It's all about what God has done for us in giving us the priceless treasure of Jesus. And that priceless treasure, worth everything that we have got, comes to us in and through the ordinary people and the ordinary experiences of our lives. That has certainly been my experience in life and in ministry. In the midst of life as it is, living and working with people as they are, the kingdom of heaven, the reign of God, has been made real to me. Jesus has been present with me. And that reality has been the richest treasure of my life. There have been other treasures as well, of course. And these other things are treasures because they have helped me lay hold of the one absolutely priceless treasure, Jesus. One of those other treasures has been my family. And I bet some of you thought of that when I said, what do you value most? My family. I have been blessed from the very beginning of my life with a family that has nurtured me and helped me grow as a person of faith. My childhood family uh, read from the Bible and prayed at home, and we went to church every week, sometimes several times a week. And there was nothing more important to us than a relationship with God. Nothing more important than knowing Jesus. Now, my childhood family was not a perfect family. I did not have perfect parents. And when I came to begin a family of my own, I didn't manage to create a perfect family either. In fact, I'm not even sure what such an entity uh, would look like because every person who has been a part of my family has been an imperfect person. From the beginning, I knew that the most important thing about me was not that I was a child of my parents with their particular ethnicity and race and class, all those things that I had inherited from them. The most important thing about me was that I was a child of God. And I have to say, I am so glad when I see in this congregation the parents who bring their children so their children will understand that, the parents who teach this to their children. I knew that my life was meant to be lived out of that sense of family, 
that sense of belonging to God and, and living for God's purposes in the world. Very early in my life, my parents taught me that Jesus loves me. And because Jesus loved me, I had value. And I also had a calling. Because not only did Jesus love me, he also loved all the children of the world, red and yellow, black, brown, white, all were precious in his sight. And I knew that I was supposed to live my life telling all those others about Jesus so that God's family all over the world would grow. So the perfect good news of the gospel, the good news that God loves us all so much, and the gospel's call to share that good news with others got through to me in and through the imperfect people in my family, in and through those ordinary clay pots who yet contained the presence of Jesus. Again, there was nothing extraordinary about the pots. It's what the pots contained that is significant and life-giving. And despite their ordinariness, despite the cracks in those pots, <clears throat> maybe because of the cracks in those pots, the light that is Jesus was able to shine out. And I saw that light through my ordinary clay pot of a family. So I am grateful for the treasure of family. I'm grateful for parents who helped me know the good news of Jesus. I'm grateful for a husband who has been a thoughtful and passionate follower of Jesus, always pushing me to see the implications of the gospel. I'm grateful for children and in-law children who've helped me grow in patience in grace and inclusiveness. And I am very grateful for the four beautiful little grandchildren you saw up here who have brought me deep joy and much fun and lots of noise. And really a desire to better show that light that is within me. Besides, of course, being another generation of really good sermon illustrations. <laughs> And the good news of the gospel got through to me through another ordinary clay pot, another imperfect institution, the church. Being part of the church has also been a rich treasure in my life. And again, I'm just so glad for all of you, for each one of you, those of you who come, who worship regularly, who bring your children, who understand what the church is all about and what the, what the church does out in the world. From my very earliest days, as I said, I have been a part of the church. Growing up, I didn't always like having to be at church as often as I was at church. I did not like all the people that I met at church. I have a very early memory of being in the preschool Sunday school class and there was a little boy, four years old, with whom, according to the Sunday school teacher, yes, I had to share the red crayon. And I didn't appreciate that, or him. And when I was a little bit older child, I was stunned by the man in the church who was a deacon, which in the Baptist church of my childhood was like an elder. This man who was a deacon who said during the civil rights era, if any Negroes try to come into our church, we need to stand in the door and block them. That was in a northern church, by the way. For sure, there were things not to like about the church. The church was not, is not, utopia. But it is always a collection of real and imperfect people, like the people to whom Paul was writing in the church in Corinth. But you know, it was also in the church that I learned 
that sharing isn't just a tit for tat kind of thing. You know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. We were to share because it is what God wants us to do. It's the way God wants us to relate to others. And it was in the church that I learned why that deacon was wrong. Because God loves all people everywhere and wants all of them to be a part of God's family. Red and yellow, black, brown, and white, and any other category that you can think of. It was in the church that I came to understand that the focus of my life was God and what God wanted me to do and be. It wasn't about me. It was about God. It wasn't about how good I could be or what I could accomplish. It was about what God had done for me in Jesus. And it wasn't just a me and Jesus kind of thing either. It was Jesus and me and others. In the church, I became part of a a people, part of a community of faith, part of a family that was much bigger and richer and fuller than my nuclear family, a family that covenanted with me to help me grow in my relationship with God, a family that prodded me to become more and more the person that Christ wanted me to be. It was because of the encouragement of people in the church that I heard the call of God to serve in ordained ministry. That was not something that I saw coming. It was not what I expected in my life. In the denomination in which I had grown up, women were not ministers. So that wasn't on my list of things I want to be when I grow up but I just don't think God cares very much about what's on our list. God is a God of surprise. God is a God of serendipity. So when I was not really expecting such a thing, God gave me the wonderful, joy-filled gift of ministry in the church. And these 13 years have been the icing on the cake of that gift. What is most wonderful about this gift of ministry is that over and over again, I get to see other ordinary people, basic clay pot kinds of people, letting the priceless treasure of Jesus, which is in them, shine out into the world. Of course, there are some who don't do that, and none of us do it all the time. As I said in my last sermon a month ago, The only disappointment I have had in ministry is when Christians, including myself, have not behaved like Christians. But for the most part, in each of the churches that I have been a part of, I have been stunned by the ways that people give themselves for the sake of others. I told the deacons at our last meeting that I am so grateful and really so much in awe of the ways that they and so many others, so many others of you, give and give and give of themselves, give of yourselves for the sake of others in the world. And beyond that, for the glory of God. And I also have been struck and deeply moved by the faithfulness that I have seen in people even in very difficult circumstances. I have seen people relying on God, trusting God, holding on to the promises of God, believing in the goodness of God. And seeing that has been a precious gift to me all these years. One would think that these faithful people that you have found a precious, priceless treasure worth everything else 
that you might value, worth staking your life on. My prayer for you as I leave is that you will hold on tight to that treasure, that Jesus will always be the center of your life that he will inform and shape what you do as individuals and, and what you do together as his church in this place. And I want to thank you for all the ways that you, in the midst of living ordinary lives, have let the light of Jesus shine out. You have blessed me beyond my ability to really express. But even more, you have blessed the world that God so loves. And I know that you will continue to do so. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>